So I'm Deborah Satz, and I'm the Dean of the School of Humanities and Sciences, and also a member of the Tanner Lecture Selection Committee. And it's my honor uh, to welcome you uh, to tonight's lecture, and also to introduce our Tanner speaker for the evening and our discussant. First, just a brief word about the Tanner Lectures. So the Tanner Lectures were founded in 1978. They were endowed by Obert Tanner, who was a philanthropist, an industrialist, a scholar, and also a philosopher here at Stanford and then later at the University of Utah. And he endowed these lectures to reflect on scholarly and scientific learning related to human values and the human condition. The lectures take place each year at seven universities in the United States, as well as Oxford and Cambridge. They're one of the most prestigious lectures in the humanities. And in creating the lectures, Tanner said, quote, I hope that these lectures will contribute to the intellectual and moral life of mankind. I see them as a search for a better understanding of human behavior and human values. This understanding may be pursued for its own intrinsic worth, but it may also eventually have practical consequences for the quality of our personal and social lives. So that's a very noble um, uh, ambition that's motivating the lectures, um, and it's an important one. Human values are found across every dimension of our social and natural lives from questions of the ethics of self-driving cars to our obligations to strangers to questions that arise even in the so-called dismal science of economics. So just to quote Gladstone, budgets are not simply matters of arithmetic, but they're also records of what we care about and what we think we ought to do. This year's Tanner Lectures are exploring an important complex and surprising aspect of recent US history, the rise of what our lecturers are calling deaths of despair. In yesterday's lecture, Anne Case developed the argument that US capitalism is not working well for those without a college degree. A key piece of evidence is the rise in suicides and drug and alcohol related deaths Large numbers of people have been left out and excluded from the benefits of living in a developed country, and they see little progress in their own lives and have few hopes for their children. And as I was listening to the lecture, there was a quote from Dante that kept going through my mind where Dante says, without hope, we live in desire. That is, without a sense of possibility in an open future, we're just fall back on um, momentary pleasures and the relief of pain. So our Tanner lectures this year are two distinguished economists and co-authors, a husband and wife dynamic duo. Anne Case, Professor Emerita of Economics from Princeton, introduced the phenomenon of deaths of despair in yesterday's lecture. Tonight, I introduce the second half of that team, Sir Angus Deaton. Angus is a senior scholar and the Dwight Eisenhower Professor of Economics and International Affairs Emeritus at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and the Economics Department at Princeton University. His research touches almost every dimension of our lives, from poverty, inequality, health, well-being, economic development, and randomized control trials. His work, which is incredibly rigorous and detailed, I read a quote where the economist um, Bill Easterly says, torturously detailed, very <laughs> detailed, he swings at the big kind of questions that not many people are willing to take on. These questions concern such issues as What's wrong with contemporary capitalism? Can capitalism work for everyone? What kinds of inequality are objectionable? He's also written on economic methodology, asking whether random controlled trials should be thought of as the gold standard in guiding our thinking about poverty alleviation and development. All of these are significant questions, 
In fact, he's contributed to so many areas of economics, it's hard in a brief introduction to do justice to his achievements. So I'll just note, he's been awarded with the highest academic accolades that his profession bestows, including the 2015 Nobel Prize in Economics for his work illuminating the role that consumption plays in human well-being and economic development, the Frisch Medal for his work in ec econometrics. He's a fellow of the British Academy, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the National Academy of Sciences, and he was knighted in um, 2015. So he's a wonderful example of an economist who swings wide, pays incredible attention to detail and evidence, and is not afraid to follow his arguments wherever they lead. His talk will be followed by a commentary by Stanford's emeritus, Henry J. Kaiser Professor of Economics, Victor Fuchs. Many people would say that Vic invented the field of health economics. He certainly understands more about healthcare delivery than just about anybody else. Um, he's written extensively on the cost of medical care and on the socioeconomic determinants of health. He's been interested in the role of physician behavior and in financial incentives in determining healthcare expenditures. And he recently proposed a universal healthcare voucher system in which all families or individuals would be given a voucher financed by an earmarked value added tax that would guarantee them coverage in a private health plan with a standardized package of benefits, including basic health services and catastrophic coverage. He's a member of the Institute of Medicine and was president and distinguished fellow of the American Economic Association. He received the Distinguished Investigator Award and the Distinguished Fellow Award from the Association for Health Services Research and was awarded the Baxter Foundation's Health Service Research Prize. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And at the age of 94, he published his 17th and most recent book. We're waiting for the 18th. Um, and the book is called Health Economics and Policy, Selected Writings. He's also an incredibly modest man. Somewhere I read that he refers to himself as the Blanche Dubois of economics, um, <laughs> saying that um, he always learned from lots of other people and benefited from the kindness of strangers in putting together his amazing work. So we're in for a real treat uh, tonight. So please join me in welcoming Angus Deaton to deliver the second panel lecture. Thanks so much. What a wonderful introduction. Um, I think maybe the only thing that Deborah missed is a comparison of heights between me and Vic. Um, I think Vic's probably got about an inch on me. Um, he's one of the very few people who makes me uncomfortable when I talk to him. Um, though not as bad as Paul Volcker, who is um, 6'10", I think, and for a while had the office next to me, and that was a disaster. Um, Anne started us off yesterday, and this is a sort of summary slide that she already showed us. Um, about the bad stuff that's happening starting from the base year, those born in 1950 and who entered the labor market around 1970, a whole list of bad stuff that was happening to those who were not fortunate enough to get a BA. Um, she talked about suicide, about drug mortality, about chronic pain, sciatic pain, difficulty socializing, difficulty relaxing, mental distress, heavy drinking, um, high body mass index, um, not being married, out of the labor force, low and falling real wages, and falling attachment um, to religion. Those are things that are not happening um, to people who have a BA, so there's this very sharp divide. I'm going to try to sell you a story um, which puts some of what we think is going on behind that. And we're going to talk quite a bit about economic prospects, um, but we don't think, we think that without what's happened in the economy, these things would not have happened, 
but that what happened in the economy is not enough by itself. And it actually works through things that really matter to people, like falling apart marriages, um, not knowing your kids, failing relationships with your children, the failure of religion to support people, increasing social isolation. And for many people, and this I think is the key important, persistent and intractable um, physical pain. So those are the things that are the sort of proximate causes. And we're going to argue that this long-term failure, this drip, drip, drip of a weakening economy for those people lies behind that too. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the roots of despair, following up a little more on what Anne talked about yesterday. And then I'm going to talk about opioids. Um, I then want to talk about the American healthcare system. And then I want to talk about upward redistribution um, by corporate America. The book, which has the same title as um, Deaths of Despair and the Failure of Capitalism, um, elaborates this in a lot more detail. And one of the things we're really concerned about is redistribution, but a redistributive system that's actually fleecing people at the bottom in order to enrich people at the top. So I want to give you examples of that. And at the very end, I'll give you a sketch of policies. I'm not going to have time to talk about them. And maybe we can talk about them tomorrow or in um, discussion period. I just want to list some. So the roots that Anne didn't talk about labor market decline, not directly through material welfare, but loss of community. Let me show you some pictures of that. Um, and so here is another one of these cohort graphs that those of you who were here yesterday um, probably had more than you wanted to see, but they really do the job for us. So these are um, real wages, um, and they're median real wages, so they're sort of halfway up the distribution of real wages for these various groups. The guys on top are people who have a BA or more. They get higher wages. Um, the guys on the bottom are people with less than a BA, and age is along the bottom. So what you're looking at is the life course um, from people joining the labor force in their 20s until their mid-50s um, here. Um, you'll see that, as I said, the BA or more get higher wages. They're on top. Um, the profiles are different, too, that people with a BA um, start off about the same place, but their wages rise throughout their lives and keep on rising until quite late in their lives. Um, the people without a BA have much flatter um, profiles um, that f are, just don't rise in the same sort of way. This has long been known to labor economists. So each one of these lines um, is a birth cohort. So um, if you start at the top, um, you can see the black line the lowest black line is the co birth cohort of 1940, and we trace them from like in their 30s through to their 50s, and that's the black line. Then the cohort of 55, we, we could put them all in between, but it'd just be a mess. The cohort of 55 um, is the broken black line, and you can see that they had higher wages at the same age throughout their whole lives, which is what you'd like to see happening. Um, as the economy grows and people get better off. And the 1975 cohort is the dotted black line, and you can see that, and then you can see just a little bit of the 1990 cohort. They're too young for us to follow them very far. And this is, there's a big blue arrow upwards there, which says the direction of time is going up that way, right? So the younger birth cohorts have higher profiles all through. Now go to the bottom one, and you can see the situation completely reversed. So the 1940 cohort is on top, the 55 cohort is behind that, the 75, it should be 75, is the next one down, and then 1990. So that each successive birth cohort of people without a BA have had a lower lifetime profile of real wages. So that's the sort of first symptom of something that's really gone wrong. This is a big chunk of the economy. It's about two-thirds um, of, um, these are all whites, um, non-Hispanic, it's about two-thirds of this group. And the proportion is not changing very much over time. So this is not to do with selection of various sorts. Um, that's pretty constant. And for some comparisons, selection is obviously important. So that's wages, so that this sort of slow drip of life circumstances getting worse. If you look at participation in the labor force, um, here um, the solid lines are for men, um, the broken lines are for women, um, the darker lines are for people without a BA, and the uh, lighter lines are for people 
um, with the BA. You can see that this is the employment population ratio. So it's just a fraction of people who are actually in the workforce um, over time for what we like to call in economics prime age people, 25 um, to 64. Um, and what you can see is for all of these groups, this thing has a downward slope, um, but the downward slope is much more severe for the darker colored things who are the people without BAs. If you look at the men and women are separate here because they're rather different. And a lot of the things we look at, men and women are not that different. And there's, of course, the secular trend upwards in labor force participation for women, um, especially for people without a BA. Um, and that stopped just after 2000 and is now going um, in the other direction. But if the story you can sort of see for men with less than a BA, these dotted lines are recessions. So every time the economy, um, you know, there's unemployment, people get shaken out of the labor force and they don't necessarily look for work, they just stay out for a bit. And then as the economy recovers, they come back and then the next recession they drop out again. But it's a ratchet in that they're not catching up every time, especially um, since um, 1990. And you can see they're now currently doing pretty well, um, but again, uh, we'll see whether they ever get back to where they were before the Great Recession um, in 2008. So you get this falling wages, less attachment to the labor force. So one is sort of material well-being. Um, the other contributes to, you know, the meaning in people's lives. They have jobs. Um, of course, the declining wages are associated with people moving down the jobs ladder in many cases. So many people are still in work, but they're not in the sort of jobs that they used to have. This shows not in the labor force by birth cohort, BA on the bottom, not BA. And you see the same thing. This is just a BA phenomenon. Each cohort is less likely to be in the labor force. Let's turn to marriage now. So again, start over on the right, which is in some sense the natural thing. Um, a lot of 30-year-olds are not married, but they're going to get married later. Um, and then marriage, fraction of marriage rises up until mid-40s, and then people get divorced or people die, and you get widows and widowers. And so there's natural rise and then gentle fall. Um, but look on the left um, for people with BA. Each cohort is less, sorry, people without a BA. Um, each cohort is less likely to be married. So marriage is failing people too. Um, this picture shows ever married, which takes out obviously the widows and things at the end. But you can see very much the same effect. The BAs are doing great. Now, of course, what's happening here, and I don't really have time to have too many slides about this or any more slides, but really good work by sociologists on what's been happening to these people. It's not, they're not getting married. But they are shacking up, as we used to say. I don't know whether people still use that term. Um, when my mother said that, it was not a friendly term. Um, and it was not something I was supposed to do. For me, it seemed like nirvana, but never mind. Um, so these people, they get together, they cohabit, and they have kids together. But those cohabitations are very unstable. So they might stay together for three or four or five years. They have a kid or two kids. And then the woman sees someone with better prospects, um, gets rid of the guy, marries, not, doesn't marry someone else, has a kid or one with them. So you, you, this to me, I mean, if, you get, if you're a man in your mid-50s, um, you might have three, four kids, none of whom you know, all of whom are living with other men. Um, you're getting to that time in life when you begin to wonder whether things are what your life was worth, and you don't have the comfort and joys of family and kids. They're all broken up. In Europe, this is not happening. In Europe, they don't get married either, um, but, and they cohabit. But the cohabitations are stable, much more stable than in America. Um, and we don't obviously know exactly why that is, but there's a big literature on that. This is weekly church attendance. Um, people with a BA more likely to go to church. And people without a BA less likely. And they've both been falling over time, but the gap's been getting wider. So these bits of religion are not really working for people either. 
just a note on voting. Um, voting has not been falling, um, at least in presidential um, elections, um, but it's much lower among people without a BA. And there's a Pew survey in 2016 that more than two thirds of whites without a BA said there was no point in voting because elections were controlled by the rich and by big corporations. So I'm going to talk about corporate behavior, rent seeking and individual well-being. I want to start from the most extreme example of opioids. So you never quite know whether to start with the benign and work up to the bad stuff or I thought we'd start with the really bad stuff. And um, so um, opioids are the largest of the three deaths of despair of drug overdose, suicide and alcoholic liver disease. Um, drugs are the biggest, but the other two are bigger together. So it's not like drugs are at all and there's just a little bit of other stuff. Um, our argument is that the despair has been unrolling for a very long time um, and it precedes opioids and that opioids made it much worse. So we're certainly not claiming these people would have died some other way anyway. Um, but the opioids, as Anne likes to say, were pouring fuels on the flames. I mean, there was a lot of unhappiness and then this horrible stuff. Um, came along. So opioids, many people here know a lot more about them than I do. Um, but here's just a quick primer. They relieve pain. They also provide euphoria. Um, they promote physical dependence and they promote addiction. Addiction is not a technical medical term. It's more a behavioral um, term um, for cravings and all the rest of it. Um, physical dependence is your body becoming dependent on this. There's been, as Anne documented yesterday, a big upsurge in pain in the U.S. over the last 40 years, with once again each successive birth cohort experiencing reporting more pain. So then starting in around the early 1990s, the pain docs started arguing for using opioids for chronic pain. Until then, American physicians were extremely unwilling to use opioids for anything, even for people who were terminally ill from cancer, for instance. Um, pain became the fifth vital sign, along with temperature, pulse, respiration, and blood pressure. You got these pain charts in your doctor's office that never used to be there. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. And the docs argued, properly prescribed, opioids had little danger of addiction and it was fine to use them for chronic pain. Let me tell you a little bit about the history since I think it's relevant here and it's sort of a little more lighthearted because it's a further away. Opiates have used about as long as the recorded history um, exists and one particular episode, um, opium was exported by Britain from India to China or at least by the East India Company which by the middle of the 19th, early 19th century um, was almost de totally dependent for its profits on that opium trade. Otherwise, it would have gone belly up. China occasionally tried to stop the drug dealers. It was sort of off and on, depending on whether we're focused on that or something else. Two of the most famous drug dealers were fellow Scots of mine, um, both medical doctors, um, sort of linked there, um, Jardin and Matheson. Um, Lin Chi Xu, who was the um, consul in Canton, now Guangzhou, destroyed large amounts of opium and Jardin and Matheson went to the British government to lobby for a recompense. Um, and eventually, after a very, you know, Britain in its imperial period did some pretty horrible things, but it tended to have very long ethical discussions about whether to do those before they did them. <laughs> and then they did them. So there's a long debate in Parliament with lots of opposition and so on. But eventually, Melbourne sent in the gunboats and then he went riding in the park with Queen Victoria. I don't know if you've seen the television series. Anyway. Um, so that began of what is still known to this day in China as a century of humiliation and which keeps coming up in the trade negotiations today, sort of, I mean, it's fresh in Chinese uh, minds. And one of the lessons from that is very hard to keep out the drug dealers if they have guns, money, or political power. And Jordan and Matheson, far from being punished from that, it's today one of the 200 largest firms in the world. 
Um, Lin is known to this day as the Chinese national hero, and there's a very fine statue of him in Chinatown. Um, more recently, opiates were used in the US Civil War. Um, women grew opium to make morphine um, for soldiers on the battlefield. And then, in another parallel with this thing that's happened today, another Scotsman, Alexander Wood, invented the hypodermic needle. And he claimed that morphine was not addictive if it was injected as opposed to um, eaten. And so there was a huge explosion of the use, and the soldiers were given shots and hypodermic syringes. And in the end, estimates suggest about 100,000 soldiers became addicted to the point where opium addiction was known as soldier's disease. Um, about 30 years later, Bayer synthesized heroin. And once again, they sold heroin as non-addictive. You know, people are worried about addiction. And it's not just today that people are worried about addiction. And that medical advances come along that are supposed to sort of deal with. And this spread widely through the population. It was used for minor aches or pains. Um, it was given to children in large quantities. You know, if, <laughs> if your kid is making a lot of noise and you want to get on and do something else, um, heroin worked pretty well. <laughs> um, we think of that as pretty horrible, but it was pretty standard. And eventually, the medical profession turned against their colleagues and other people and got it under control. And the Harrison Act in 1914 marked sort of the end of that epidemic, and heroin was completely outlawed in 1924. So how come, you would have thought, given this history, how come we have another iatrogenic epidemic um, almost 100 years later? One is the slow change in attitudes by physicians. There is all this chronic pain out there, and no one really knows how to treat it. Doctors are very bad at treating lower back pain for example, and it does terrible things to people. Oxycontin, which is one of the big villains of the piece, was approved by the FDA in 1995. It entered the market in 96. By 2016, more than 100 million people were getting prescriptions for Oxycontin or some similar opioid. Um, Oxycontin so far have been more than $50 billion of sales. Um, the family um, it's a family firm known by the Sackler family, who are, of course, major philanthropists, whose name appears on buildings. Every time I get an invitation from the National Academy of Sciences, it has Sackler written all over it. Um, they're very uninterested in pursuing the question as to whether they might do something about that, it turns out. Um, relentless pushing by pharma and by prescription benefit managers. Overdose deaths began in the early 90s, and now the annual toll is more than the peak of HIV. More people are dying from opioids than from guns. More people than died in the Vietnam War. And the cumulative total since 2000 is more than the deaths from the two world wars taken together. So you're talking about, you know, very large numbers of deaths. This is not. And of course, this monster was created by the American healthcare system. Um, docs were probably not the guiltiest people here, but they were certainly guilty of careless overprescribing, from which there was a lot of diversion. Um, created a black market. There was a parallel epidemic of black tar heroin coming from Mexico. Uh, docs eventually realized what was going on. They pulled back. Oxycontin was reformulated to make it harder to abuse. And then the heroin dealers moved in, and then most later heroin, actually cheaper and stronger than Oxycontin. And then most recently, fentanyl replaced heroin as the main cause of overdoses, especially in the eastern United States. This is now, as the dikes have pulled back, sparked a secondary um, epidemic of illegal um, drug addiction and death. And fentanyl is now the largest killer among these things. But having started this thing off, it was sort of irresistible. Um, there are many long-term heroin addicts in the United States who've been functioning pretty well until now. But now they can't guarantee their supply has not been adulterated with fentanyl. And you read stories of people who've been taking a daily shot of heroin for many years. And now every time they shoot up, they wonder if this day is going to be their last because the supply has been adulterated. 
So, you know, this is an epidemic, but it's not like a virus or a bacterium. Other countries have opioids, they don't have the epidemic. 75% um, of the victims have a high school degree education or less, only 10% have a BA. And these people are the people whose lives coming apart we've been documenting. And so this was a fertile field for them. Pharma companies were allowed to enrich themselves enormously by pumping out huge quantities. They used contract congress to stop attempts to police. The DEA was closing in on McKesson, one of the biggest distributors. And when the guy who was about to bring the warrants went to work, all his staff were gone um, and Congress had closed down that part of the DEA. The guy who did it, a uh, guy called Tom Marino in Congress, was then nominated by Trump to be the drug czar. Um, Orrin Hatch has played a long and deeply undistinguished role in protecting pharmaceuticals against um, proper regulation. Um, they talk about laundering it through philanthropy. Um, and there's 60 Minutes had a story about um, Purdue lobbying the FDA for a label change so that it became an on-label use for chronic pain, um, which was part of what really ignited the epidemic of death. So um, it's not clear that this stuff really does very much good. I mean, that's still disputed. Um, it's not clear that opioids are more effective for chronic pain than other sometimes called interdisciplinary methods that were used for chronic pain before. And also pain continues to rise in the U.S. The level of reported pain is getting worse and worse, even though 100 million people are taking these drugs. Um, the FDA has come under a lot of fire from this. The fact that um, the... Um, these prescriptions would be diverted it was entirely anticipatable, but the FDA's mandate is not to look at things like that, but only to look at what it does for individuals, not to what it does for society. And there's a National Academy of Medicine report suggesting that that be changed, and there's a lot of discussion about that. Going back to the opium war, the British didn't control all the opium. Um, there was opium from the west of India, um, which was controlled by a gentleman called Jan Setchi Jijiboy, um, who was known as the Malwa Opium King. And in fact, it was his competition with Jordan and Matheson that brought the price of opium down to the point where ordinary people in China could get addicted and which prompted <coughs> the Chinese to clamp down on the thing. He got enormously rich. He was the first Indian to be knighted by Queen Victoria. And then after 20 more years of doing this, he was then promoted to a baronetcy. And if you go to Bombay today, you still see Sir JJ hospitals all over the place as part of his philanthropy. So all of this has happened before. All right, so <laughs> let's get a little cheerier <laughs> um, and talk about the other monster in the room, which is the American healthcare um, system. And I think of this as, this is, you know, we're not talking about, well, we are talking about drug dealers, but um, it, it's not, it doesn't have this large illegal component. So this is, I, I now I'm starting to shake because Vic Fuchs is sitting there and everything I know about this I learned from him. And he's going to get up at the end and tell you that I didn't learn it right. But let me, let me try. So our healthcare is the most expensive in the world and delivers the worst health. Um, in 1970, the US was only a little worse than other wealthy countries, but since then, expenditures have grown while life expectancy has increased only slowly. And as Anne said yesterday, life expectancy is now falling and has fallen for three years in a row. So the truth is this, is that American healthcare is incredibly bad at promoting health. It's incredibly good at promoting the financial well-being of healthcare providers. So, you know, it's not really in the business of making us healthy. It's in the business of making enormous sums of money. So here's some data from our world and data, the wonderful website that has all these numbers. 
and um, we pulled these down and pulled out some countries. So just to show you what these graphs are, the thing along the horizontal axis is money um, expenditure per head in US dollars adjusted in various ways. <coughs> and there's life expectancy at birth, which runs from 70 up. And then these lines are going through time. So it starts at the bottom left and moves right as life expectancy goes up and as more gets spent. So that's the UK. Um, um, you can see that when Gordon Brown saved the National Health Service, um, you get this big increase in expenditure, and then it sort of came up a bit. Um, so there's Australia, which looks not very different from the UK. <coughs> there's Canada, which is quite a lot more expensive than those other two countries. Um, here is France, which is somewhere in between, and the French, by and large, are extremely pleased with their healthcare system. Here's Switzerland. <coughs> And Switzerland is the second most expensive after us. Um, so you can see the line has moved over to the right. They have pretty good life expectancy too. They're very high life expectancy, but it costs a lot. So here's the US, and this is the US in 1970 and 1982. And you can see it's a little bit worse than all of these countries even in 1970 and 1982. But if you roll it forward, it looks like that. So it's just, you know, why are they good at making money or at costing money? They're not very good at health. And you can see at the very end there, life expectancy beginning to turn down. So it's not even delivering that. So life expectancy is now falling while money is redistributed up. And the government, instead of stopping this, basically licenses the upward redistribution of income. I mean, if this were really a free market, which it's not, this really wouldn't be happening. It's this combination of an industry with the government which allows enormous amount of rent seeking um, to go on. So it's like a giant shakedown in which the government is complicit. Um, I think Vic said this, um, which is like a tribute to a foreign power. We're spending enormous amount of money every year as if you know we'd been conquered by Iceland or somewhere. And we had to pay this enormous tribute to Iceland every year so that they wouldn't kill us even more. But we're doing it to ourselves. So this is the, the healthcare system is really a perfect example of how rent seeking generates inequality, enriching a few at the expense of many. And the problem about healthcare is not just what it does to health, it's what it does to your pocketbook and the cost of it. And it's one of the major factors that's holding wages down in the way that I showed earlier. So, you know, this is one of the things. People say, well, it's not generating very good health, and it may even be generating opioids and doing bad things, but that's not the monster. The monster is that it's oppressing us by taking all this money away. So, um, again, um, Vic and I think a few others talked this first, the, the, the trillion dollar protection racket. Um, we spent 17.8% of GDP in 2018. Switzerland's at next at 12.4. Swiss lived three years longer. The difference between 17.8 and 12.4 is 5.4%, which is more than a trillion dollars. Um, so that's more than $8,300 for each household in the United States. So, you know, if you gave that back to people, a lot of this stuff <laughs> about bad wages would just go away, right? And we're not getting anything for it. I mean, this is like a horrible self-inflicted wound. Um, well, why does it cost so much? Well, this is pretty well known. Um, a lot of it's prices. It's not all prices. There's a lot. We do more, too. Um, but docs are allowed to restrict entry into medical school. There are fewer docs than we might have. Um, pharmaceuticals are typically about three times more expensive, even for identical products. So Crestor is $86 a month in the US after discount. You're getting a good deal. $41 in Germany, $9 in Australia. Hip replacements, I have two of those. Um, they're three times more expensive. I could have had my hip replaced in South Africa, purely paid for every bit of it myself for less than the deductible that I had to pay under Princeton's healthcare plan. Um, Britain has a regulatory agency, which it does sort of cost-benefit analysis of pharmaceuticals and devices and so on, and basically doesn't license them, them 
um, unless they actually do some good. I like the parallel between scanners and scammers. You know, these scammers come to your office if you're a physician selling a scanner and tell you how much you can charge for each scan that no one really needs. And of course, by the time they've discovered they don't work, there's a new sort of scanner with proton beams instead of x-rays and all the rest of it. Hospitals are merging and raising prices. We seem to have pretty much given up on antitrust enforcement. Um, they work hand in hand with the uh, pharma companies. Many of you will have seen the scandal at, um, um, what's it called, Malone, yeah, Memorial Sloan Kettering um, recently, um, where you know the, the patients were sort of being used as guinea pigs for clinical trials um, by the docs who were being paid by the pharma companies. And of course, the docs say that this is giving our patients the most best drugs quicker than anyone else, and so it's in the patient's interest. Um, the fact that they forget to declare this on their papers seems some, something, seems to suggest that they know something's wrong. Um, the government helps keep prices up through lobbying, um, and of course, Medicare prices, Medicare is not allowed to negotiate on prices, and even more fundamental, Medicare is required to purchase all drugs that the FDA approves. Um, I wanted to say a word or two about lobbying because I think it's actually quite important here. In 2018, the healthcare industry employed 2,800 lobbyists. Um, that's five for each member of Congress. Um, there were negligible numbers in 1970. I mean, often when I say this, people say, well, you know, the right to the right, right to address your representatives is in the U.S. Constitution. You know, it's always been there, but it really wasn't. I mean, in 1970, there were some trade associations in Washington, but almost no lobbyists. So this is something that's happened since 1970. And this came out yesterday. I mean, 1970 is sort of a hinge point. And 1970, in that healthcare expense graph, that's when the lobbyists really started to move in. Half of whom are what are known as revolvers meaning they used to be congressmen or senators or staff of congressmen and senators. Um, they spent $556 million in 2018. Half of that came from pharma. Um, that's more than the financial industry. If you think of the banks as doing all this lobbying, sure they do, but not compared with the healthcare industry. And it's 10 times as much as the total of all organized labor. So if you think of politics about power, um, then, you know, and unions are there, but they're just tiny compared to any of this that's going on. One example is that pharma, for many, many years, their lobbyists opposed any Medicare drug benefit. And as they got stronger and stronger and got more and more lobbyists, they judged that the moment had come in which they could, because they were frightened of price controls. And then they realized they were strong enough to block the price controls and have a Medicare benefit. And then it was instituted with the price control, with the lack of price controls or the prohibition on any price controls. So, you know, when you look at that, that's just lobbying, they, you know. And then when they turn around and say, this is a free market, and if you try to stop this, this it's nothing to do with a free market. Um, it's um, rent seeking and lobbying. So then the question is, if we back away, you know, the OPIs are the worst. <laughs> The healthcare system's pretty bad. How about all industries? You know, is it capitalism that's deeply corrupt? Well, no, it's not true any more than the Sacklers are like a typical pharma manufacturing. And the healthcare and the opioids are certainly the worst cases. But, you know, you can read accounts of what happens in finance and you can find lots of evidence of rent seeking in other um, industries too. There's been an explosion of literature in economics over the last. Um, five or six years, I guess, um, <clears throat> about increasing monopoly power and rent seeking by executives at the expense of laborers and consumers. And also monopsony, which is the other side of monopoly. Monopsony is when you're the only buyer and you have control over labor. I thought this literature had really come of age when last summer at the Jackson Hole Conference, where all the central bankers of the world to get together, they talked about monopsony and monopoly. So it's like it's even got onto, you know, the, the central bank agenda. 
Um, this literature is extremely controversial. Um, and there's really good work being done on both sides of this um, by people who think there, there's certainly a lot of concentra increasing concentration across industries. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is really what's being debated. Um, we spend five weeks in Montana every summer. There's no doubt at all that the growth of Amazon has brought more competition to Montana, not less competition, because if you're buying something locally, you now have competitors that just didn't used to be there. Amazon has done wonderful things for us too, but people are terrified of the prices. So there's huge debates going on around that in relation to GAFA. I guess GAFA is the European term, and FANGs is what they call them here. Anyway, Google, Apple, Facebook, and... Um, Amazon. Um, one of the more interesting debates is, is between Brandeis on the one hand and Bork on the other hand. And Bork basically argued that previous antitrust enforcement, which much of which developed under Brandeis, um, was deeply flawed because it didn't focus on the prices, which is what really counted. Uh, very much a sort of Chicago view that material well-being is the thing we should really care about. And if you get lower prices, it's improving your, mental, your <laughs> material well-being. Um, Brandis, on the other hand, thought that size was bad in and of itself um, because it threatened democracy, for example. And that debate is very much being brought back to life again. Um, there's no doubt, however, that things have gotten much tougher um, for labor. Um, there's been a lot, again, a debate about stakeholders versus shareholders, um, that shareholder value is not the same thing as stakeholder value because firms maybe should have responsibility to customers and their workers. Um, in England, for instance, the law is not shareholder maximization. It's the benefit of the corporation, and that's what the board is supposed to do. Um, in the US, there are many interpretations. It's not entirely clear um, what the law actually says. Many people think the stock market is an indicator of well-being, which is one of the craziest things there's ever been. Because if you have a world in which GDP is not going up, but profits are being, or value added is being distributed towards profits and away from labor, that increases the stock market. And that's an indicator, among other things, of the balance between profits and labor. Um, one of the things that's clearly changed the power of labor is the almost total elimination of unions in the private sector. Um, their peak was in the 1950s. Um, the literature on unions suggests they raised the pay of members. To some extent, they raised the pay of non-members because many non-unionists were covered by union contracts. They tend to police workplace safety and work conditions in a way that the feds couldn't always do. Um, they moderated executive salaries, um, stock buybacks, which is another topic I could talk about at length, um, because they had to persuade you know, the workers had some power over what the executives did. Unions were also social centers in many places. Bob Putnam's solitary bowler was bowling all by himself in a union hall, you know, and now there's no union hall, there's no solitary bowler. Um, and they protested management techniques that hurt workers, and they took political action on behalf of workers. And as you saw from the lobbying numbers, that's really just not there anymore. Um, outsourcing has become a big deal um, that um, the, the workers who do janitorial work or food services or transport um, have mostly been formed out to outsourcing companies, often with very few benefits and so on. And one thing that you don't have is you don't belong to the firm anymore if you've been outsourced to an outside agency. And there are many stories, I don't know how common it was, of people who started out as janitors finishing up as CEOs. That's not possible if you're not inside the same firm anymore. There's literature in labor economics called rent sharing, which says if profits and um, if value added in the firm goes up, is some of it shared with labor? And the answer to that literature has usually been yes, some part of it is shared with labor. And that share seems to have fallen. Um, over time. And of course, people who've been outsourced don't benefit from that at all. There's a lot been written on non-compete clauses. 
you know, if you work for a hedge fund, you can see why you might have to sign a non-compete clause. They're now using them in fast food joints. Um, you don't get incredible marketing skills in a McDonald's, um, but if you can't compete, you can't go work for another McDonald's, it helps hold down your wages. And there's a lot to be written on the politics of this um, and the courts and the way the courts have become much more friendly to anti-union work. So <clears throat> this is really the last slide, and then I'm going to stop. So this is a picture that we're trying to tell a management and capital working against labor and consumers in a way that this balance of power has really changed over time. And it's the sort of story of why these people without BAs are not being well served compared with people like us um, who are doing um, pretty well. Um, some people will say, you haven't talked about automation, you haven't talked about globalization, um, isn't that what's happening? Well, <coughs> yes, I mean, those things have certainly weakened the negotiating positions of unions. But, you know, they have robots in Germany, too. They have robots in Britain. They have globalization all around the world. And you don't see any of these deaths there. You don't see 50 years of falling and stagnant wages in any of those countries. Um, you've seen, actually, about 20 years of it in Britain. And there's been a fairly long period in Germany, too. So one of the questions that came up yesterday and is a frontline question is, is what is happening in America just uh, you know, a prequel to what's going to happen um, in Europe? Or is it a peculiarly American um, phenomenon? I think the Europeans should be very scared. Um, so our argument really is policy made it worse as government and law join the rent seekers. Um, and the political thing is sort of important here because after 1968, the Democrats more or less explicitly abandoned um, the white working class and the unions and became a coalition of elites and minorities. And the Republicans took over the white working class, um, largely on social grounds, but then they finished up paying a lot for their social um, preferences. So I'm not going to talk about this because I don't have time, but here's a large list of things that you could consider. Um, healthcare reform, I think, is the most obvious one. And, you know, Nye Bevan was the Welsh coal miner unionist who started the healthcare system in Britain. And when asked how he dealt with the doctors, how he made them go away, he said he stuffed their mouths with gold. And of course, that's what you have to do. If you're paying a, a, a ransom to someone, you can't just say, go away, because going away, you know, they wouldn't, you wouldn't be paying the ransom if they would just go away. But what you have to do is you have to come up with a deal, which costs a lot in the short run, but you get it back over time. And we're going to have to do something like that um, with health care. There's a bunch of other things for people. I imagine there are a lot of people who are interested in UBI. Um, I'm not in favor of UBI. I think, I, you know, I think there's wonderful arguments for it, but not entirely persuasive. Um, in the end, we suspect the biggest difference between here and Europe is the sort of fierceness of competition on the one hand, but also the existence of safety nets. And we really don't have a safety net here, anything like we have in Europe. They also don't lobby like we do. All right, um, I just wanted to show you, that's Mr. Jardin on the left. <laughs> that's Sir James Matheson. Um, he became a fellow of the Royal Society, actually governor of the Bank of England. And he got so rich, he bought most of Scotland. You know, huge chunk. He owned the Isle of Lewis. And he actually, um, he presided as he exported many of the inhabitants of the Isles of Lewis to Canada. Some of you, there was a great Highland potato famine, which is not as well known as the um, Irish potato famine, but happened somewhat later. That's Lynn in his pedestal in Chinatown in New York City. There's Sir Jem Setsi Gigiboy, the baronet who was knighted by the queen. And there is Sir Raymond Sackler, 
manufacturer of opioids, who was also knighted by the Queen in 2015 for his service to addiction. No, I'm sorry, his service to <laughs> philanthropy. And there's Brandeis and Robert Bork, um, two more modern figures involved in these debates. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deborah, for a very gracious introduction. Um, I'm tempted to say that I don't deserve it. But I have a bad back, and I don't deserve that either. So it kind of, it kind of evens out. Thank you, Anne and Angus, for two wonderful lectures. We really, all of us, I think, learned a great deal. And some of us were even motivated to think more positively about the future if we will listen to some of the wise things that were said over the last couple of days. The, uh, your work uh, is so good because uh, unlike uh, many economists who see something that works in practice and wonders if it'll work in theory, uh, the, did somebody laugh? <laughs> Uh, you see things that don't work in practice and ask yourself how you can make it better. And I admire that a great deal. The, the questions you ask are important questions. Uh, secondly, you approach the work primarily in an empirical fashion. You're depending on data to supply most of the answers to the questions that you're asking. It's an, I, I make a humble living uh, by that same root of empirical work. I, I like it very much. <clears throat> Practically, uh, most important of all, maybe, is values. Because when it comes to economic policy, uh, it's values that are very important. Policy is really the place, the crossroads between values and analysis. And I share your values to an incredible extent. Uh, if I didn't know better, I would think that Angus and I, when we were boys, uh, we sat in the same pew together. But that didn't happen, and nobody laughed this time. I, I, I'm just really. <laughs> but uh, we may have read from the same book. You can think about that also. I'm very honored to be asked to be uh, <clears throat> the commentator on such uh, distinguished uh, lectures and such distinguished book. Uh, I've, I've got a feeling now, though, that in selecting me, uh, they were looking for three qualifications. Uh, one, that the commentator should be taller <laughs> than the lecturer. The second, that he should be older than the <laughs> And that's certainly true, and, and more infirm. <laughs> and, and I was probably the only person who met all three <laughs> qualifications. Now, given so much agreement, uh, what is a commentator supposed to do? You know, I could nitpick, just pick a little thing here about theory or about a data, or about a policy thing. But that wouldn't help you very much. And I don't think it would be of much interest uh, to the audience, unless there are a lot of economists present. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, wh what I've decided is I'm going to see, can I try in some way to make a good book better? In other words, my, my assignment from now on in is to make suggestions about things that I've heard in the lectures and that I've read in the book to see how this could just, it really is a very good book. And maybe some of these things I say in humility, but not too much humility, because you wouldn't pay any attention at all, uh, is, is maybe make it a little better. And I start with two of the most important economic developments of the last 60 years that you will mention in the book 
but I think they need more attention. They're the, what, the, let me figure out how to work this. I was before, I was born before this was invented. <laughs> and I think I can make it go, yes. <laughs> the first of these is that in the last three decades or so, uh, the rate of growth of real GDP per capita has been substantially less than in the three decades that preceded. That's a difference uh, between 2.4% per annum and 1.4% per annum. Here, being an economist is an advantage because you appreciate that a difference of that magnitude year after year makes a very great difference. <clears throat> For example, uh, if you had 2.4% per annum increase compounded over 30 years, it would take only 30 years to double the standard of living. And uh, that means that each uh, figure a generation is about 30 years. It means that the next generation would be living at a level twice that of their parents' generation. And that's something that most people would appreciate because they like having a nicer home than the one they grew up with. They like to give their children a better education than they were able to get and, and all those things. If it was only 1.4% per annum, as you see it has been in the recent decades, then it takes uh, 51 years to double. That's already moving it out quite a bit. The, the, the next generation isn't quite where they would have been. There's an even more important thing that I think about in connection with the 1.4 versus the 2.4, and that is that this, these are averages. They're averages of the whole population. And there is probably a dispersion around that average. Some people do better, some people do worse. Well, if the average is 2.4, the ones, there are quite a few who are doing worse, but they're still making progress. They're 2%, they're 1.5, they're 1, but they're moving in the right direction and they see some improvement. If the average is 1.4 and the dispersion is about the same, and I see no reason why they wouldn't be, the dispersion wouldn't be at least as great in the more recent uh, decades, then a great larger percentage of the population will be sliding into what we would call in the red. They wouldn't be making any progress at all. They would be, if anything, at a scale of living less than their parents had. So that difference between the 1.4 and the, the 2.4 thought of in those terms is very great. <laughs> Before giving you the second one, I want to go back to something that I forgot to tell you about in the beginning. And that was, like any good research, I think their research has thrown up a lot of findings that really need more investigation. And one of them that was mentioned by Anne yesterday, not mentioned by uh, Angus uh, today, was that if you look at people who went on for more schooling after uh, high school graduation but did not get a bachelor's degree, they didn't, you didn't find any significant difference in the, things, in the outcomes that you were looking at, namely the deaths of despair. That, that finding, first of all, it needs some explanation in itself, and I've thought of at least two mechanisms. One is uh, the failure to get the degree leads people to drinking and to alcoholism and other pathologies because they failed, they didn't get the degree. The other is that if you're a heavy drinker and have all kinds of uh, related other bad behaviors, you never get the degree. But in any case, I, I think people who do research on the economics of education and in general, ought to pay attention to this one 
and see if it's at all complemented by uh, a failure to benefit in other domains. Because I think uh, if we think about it in terms of earnings, I'm looking at John Pencavill and wanting a shake of a head one way or the other. <laughs> do, do additional years of schooling f between high school graduation and not getting a degree show up in earnings? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it's not a big one, but, but uh, yes. But, but, the, but year by year, the earnings go up. Yes. Yes, but not, not in the case of the deaths of despair. And that, that, that is something that should be looked into, I think, well, in more great. All right, back, back to where we were. The second big change over this longer period that we're looking at is the growth of a service economy. I've heard of it. You've heard of it. I even did some work on it. <laughs> but uh, today we live in a world that isn't dominated by steel mills and coal mines and automobile assembly lines and so on. We live in a world where people work in hospitals, they work in schools, they work in retail establishments, either brick and mortar or uh, uh, online. Uh, those are different worlds, they're different economies. They, 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 they have implications all over the map. One of them being uh, an acceptance and a, a welcoming and a much more of an opportunity for women than existed in an industrial economy. Uh, and another one being less likely to have unions. Even years ago, it was, there was a big difference at a time when half the population was working in industry and half the population was working in the service sector, most of the unions were in industry. And now, over time, that has changed. And nine, almost nine out of 10 workers are in the service sector. I think that, along with the slowing of the rate of growth of GDP per capita, you put those two things together, you've got a huge body of basic forces that are at work and that are producing some of the uh, uh, things that you are call calling causes, they're kind of intermediate because they're a consequence of those two uh, things. Now, let me uh, show you what it means in terms of earnings. Uh, <clears throat> you're all know what I mean by actual earnings, hourly earnings of the workers in these various sectors. By expected, I mean if they earned at the same national rate as their, given their demographic characteristics. Uh, I have 168 cells, and with those 168 cells, we have the actual national earnings in those cells, and we can then use the distribution of people in the sector or in the service sector, see how much they would have earned if they had earned at the national rate for their particular characteristics. And what you find is that uh, in the industry, on average, they earn, people earn more, or they did in 1959, they did earn more than was expected. And naturally, the people in the service sector earned less because together it has to come out to the national average. And uh, this is true for men. It's also true for women. It's also true for whites. It's also true for non-whites. To make it a little more specific, let's look at three particular industries and we see the differences are tremendous. These are the so-called good jobs that you hear politicians talking about all the time. Good jobs, because they had benefits in addition to these. But, but they're making 20 or 30 percent more than they would make if they made simply the average for their demographic characteristics. And the, uh, there's an offsetting in, in the service sector of some people making uh, very much less 
uh, than they would have uh, made. Now, when these so-called good jobs disappear, and, and, and should, well, I don't know, I see a lot of economists, but there are some non-economists here too. What made these good jobs? What made these good jobs was the fact that the industries that they worked in, in most cases, had a lot of monopoly power. You want to know what monopoly power means? Think of General Motors at this time. How did General Motors set the prices for their cars? They set them so that they wouldn't sell more than 50% of all the cars in America. Because they felt if they sold more than 50%, then the antitrust people would get after them. So they made sure that the price was sufficiently high to keep their sales down to 50%. That's, that's monopoly power. <laughs> Now, they set the prices so high that companies like Ford and Chrysler weren't nearly as efficient as General Motors, but they still could make very good profits coming in under that price uh, umbrella that General Motors uh, set up. So <coughs> the unions in those industries said, hey, you guys are making a tremendous uh, profit here. How about splitting some of it with us? Otherwise, we're going to make life a little difficult for you. And, and the people who running the company said, yeah, OK, that makes sense. And they, they would split it with them by giving them good benefits and by paying them a, a wage way above uh, what they would otherwise get for their demographic characteristics. All right. There are some other subjects, not quite uh, in the class of those two developments, which I think would benefit from more data and from including explicit attention to the past. This is what I mean uh, here, that some of the attempts to establish causality in the book, and there are several attempts, typically take the form of finding contemporary correlations. You find this is correlated with this, and you have reason to think that one is the cause of the other, and, and, and that suggests causality. However, that attempt to establish causality could be greatly enriched if one would look at the history of this particular phenomena. What was it like 30 years ago? What was it like 40 years ago? And, and, and you can just get a more uh, robust uh, take on it. And uh, I, I would think that the things I'm going to mention now are subjects that are discussed. Uh, I'm, I'm not in any case suggesting that the discussions are wrong, uh, but I think they would be more definitive and they, they would be more conclusive if there were more data, and particularly if the data uh, referred to earlier periods as well as contemporary periods. One of them wasn't mentioned in either of the lectures, but does play a role in the book. And that is what's going on here between the more skilled people and even sometimes even the less skilled people moving to the large cities, to New York, to San Francisco, to Los Angeles, and so forth, and denuding the rural areas, uh, and, and they, you can tell a pretty dramatic story, and pe some people do, and some people say something should be done about that. Uh, I'm not going to take a position on that one way or the other. I am going to say that this is one of the oldest stories in economic development. Ever since we've had economic development, there's been this problem of shifting to the uh, rural areas, to the cities, how are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? Very popular song after, after World War I. Uh, 18th century England, a poet named Oliver Goldsmith writes a poem called The Deserted Village. You read <laughs> How many others know Deserted Village? Not too many. It, it was a sensation in its own time because it pa painted a picture of what was happening to a particular village as the people left it to go to the city 
to get on the uh, escalator for the new industrial revolution that was starting to take place. And it had a tagline, which is, could be repeated throughout, that is, wealth accumulates, man decays. And some people could say that almost any time throughout that, this whole period of industrial realization, relation. Uh, so, but it's not only uh, in England, it's not only in the United States. USSR, in their five-year plans after World War I, uh, had a problem with people coming from the city, uh, coming to the city, N not in, according to plan, but they couldn't help. China had this after World War II. In fact, China made it illegal to come to the city if you hadn't, didn't have uh, permission and a license, everything like that, but they couldn't stop the people from coming to the city. So this is a, a, an important subject, uh, not entirely dealt with, it, it's mentioned, but not enough. Have US markets become less competitive? Angus did talk about this a little, and I, did you get an impression that he felt that U.S. markets are now less competitive than they used to be. Did you mean, you didn't mean to imply that. But they might be. They might be. So that would be an important question to investigate, whether they are or not. And that's all I'm suggesting now. Uh, <clears throat> if it's true that markets are less competitive now than they used to be, does that have any relationship to growing income inequality? I don't know the answer to that, but I think it would be, it would be good to know, especially if uh, it's changing or if it's not changing. Uh, finally, uh, something that I haven't thought about in a long time, uh, but this research caused me to think about it, and that is the role of rent seeking in a market economy in a capitalist economy. Rent sinking is peculiar because on the one hand, that's what capitalism and a market economy is all about. If you, if you weren't interested in finding a rent for non-economists, that's a return over and above what would be a normal return on capital. If you invest in a company, but your return is the same as if you bought a bond or if you bought a government bond or something like that. What's the point? The point is to get into a company, an industry, uh, some, some, something that will bring you an extra return. And that's what economists call a rent. Uh, so rent seeking is the heart of a competitive market economy. But once rents are achieved and maintained, then the question is, is there any role for uh, policy or should those rents go on for as long as, as the uh, monopoly position that you've achieved? Uh, see, now, there's another question. Should the government do anything to try to deter rent seeking? There are suggestions in the book that the government should. But it's very important, and I'm sure you would all agree, that you don't want to deter all rent seeking. After all, research and development is undertaken for what purpose? To find out something that will yield a rent to your company. Uh, advertising is undertaken for what purpose? To achieve a, a, a distinction that will enable you to earn a rent. So, you, you can't say we want to stop all rent seeking, but there, certainly uh, bribing a congressman is something that you wouldn't want to start right from the start. I'm reminded of my friend Alan Entoven. <laughs> he got a good laugh from me years ago. He explained to me what was a perfect uh, defense system for the government, and it was a defense system where parts were made in every congressional district. <laughs> and, and they didn't work. <laughs> that just opened up the whole new world to me. Uh, so uh, that's another one.
that I put down as need, needing to be pushed a little further. <clears throat> Getting to the last part of my remarks, and that has to do with the future of capitalism. And here I felt that the whole discussion was not at a level equal to the rest of the book. It, it was more uh, uh, speculative. Uh, it, it got into the polemics before enough uh, data background had been provided to justify uh, some of the uh, polemics. Uh, it, it, I feel I felt that it needs more uh, cap uh, conceptualization, uh, theorizing, if you will. I'm not a hundred percent anti-theory. <laughs> Incidentally, I thought I thought even with the main book, some sketchy idea of the kind of models that you have in mind, even though you don't make them explicit, might be useful. Useful for the reader, useful for yourselves to think about what variables haven't you included? How do the variables r relate to one another? I, I, it seems to me it could be. But anyway, I, this is the way I, my thinking started to go. Is it really capitalism that you want to explain? Because uh, capitalism is all over the world, or we, we have capitalism in China, uh, we have capitalism in these countries uh, like uh, Poland and Hungary and Turkey uh, that are moving in other directions. Is there something else going on? And I believe there is something else that's going on in the West and that has affected the West over the last uh, few uh, decades, uh, which uh, might not be uh, so much thrust at, at capitalism but maybe at democracy. Uh, or maybe it's at a liberal society, one that al allows a lot of free speech and a lot of free press, uh, free publications and so on. Is that what's uh, really at stake? Or is it the, the portion of capitalism that has to do with a, a system where prices are set in markets and market prices determine the allocation of resources for production and the distribution of income. So I think some clarification of exactly what it is that we're concerned about. For myself, I, I think that this is a, a Western problem. I don't think it's a US problem, although it manifests itself in the deaths of despair in the United States. And it may be that it didn't happen in Europe because Europe has more of a safety net, although you folks don't really think that it's the extreme poverty uh, that drives deaths of despair. So that's not uh, going to go very far. Maybe, maybe it's because they haven't allowed uh, profit-seeking firms to push uh, things as far. Uh, but they must advertise alcohol in England, France, Germany just as well. And yet, to my way of thinking, all of these uh, countries uh, have s significant problems. Uh, in England, what little I know of it, you keep an eye on it, John. Both, both, country, both parties are, are a catastrophe. Is that? Is that? Currently, yes. Yeah. <laughs> all right, I, I accept that. That's right. Doesn't, it doesn't mean it's a permanent condition. No. But on the other hand, uh, Brexit looks a little like the Trump election. <laughs> and so, so they're, they're, fr France decided to go for a leader, Macron, who would be more of a leader. And it turned out they didn't want to be his followers. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they have a leader, but no, nobody wants to listen to him. So, I, I, I think that once uh, Merkel is out of Germany and they have to have new leadership, I worry a great deal about what form that leadership will take. We know what form it has taken in the past. And uh, a, a country that went one way once could go that way again. So uh, 
I, I think it's a Western problem, not, not a U.S. problem. Uh, and here's another thing. We largely discuss these problems as if they're to be solved uh, through the social sciences, that we have better tax laws or we have better uh, antitrust uh, uh, enforcement or something of that kind. I'm not at all convinced that that's where you get to the heart of the problem. I have a feeling that the heart of the problem lies somewhere in, in the world of, of beliefs, of spirit, of, of uh, meaning of life, uh, of uh, things that go deeper into the person in terms of their psyche and the way they live and the way they behave. And I can't convince you of that, but I can close uh, with uh, two quotations that may be uh, suggestive. Nietzsche, first, he who has a why to live, a why to live can bear almost any how. And this has been picked up by a lot of people in, in psychology and psychiatry and, and think that it has a, a lot of uh, uh, depth and meaning to it. Uh, the second, Edna St. Vincent Millay, love cannot fill the thickened lung with breath, nor clear the blood, nor set the fractured bone. Yet many a man is making friends with death, even as I speak, for lack of love alone. Thank you very much. Did you have to get to your chair before me? <laughs> I just, you know, I am younger. And I'm <laughs> hang on to it as long no, as I never can. Never would have known. <laughs> Thank you, Vic. Uh, mostly. I, um, I, I just want to say one little thing, sort of off the topic. I, I do want to leave time for questions. So. Off the topic, you know, I first um, got interested in health um, about 20 years ago. And as Deborah so kindly said at the beginning, um, you know, I'm very, I find it very difficult to focus on anything for very long. <laughs> um, so I move around a lot. And in the late 90s, I started getting interested in health. And often when this has happened to me in my life, I, and, you know, I go to some strange land, the inhabitants are generally pretty hostile. But I remember talking to Vic very early on in that. And Vic was incredibly welcoming and helpful and sort of welcomed me with open arms and said, you know, let me show you a few things. And that was really just terrific. So I'll always be grateful to Vic for that. Um, quite a, on a personal level, quite apart from the wonderful body of work and wisdom about healthcare as an economist, which is quite unequaled, I think. Can, um, I, can I get a... Uh... No, you have to be quiet for me. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to answer all the things, and I can't do the Oliver Goldsmith or the um, other. But I, just to bring it back to a couple of economic things, um, and one thing that I just think is unbelievably important is what Vic said first, which is the slowing of economic growth. Um, and you know, if you look every decade since the Second World War, the growth of per capita income, even before the Great Recession, and even if you knock the Great Recession out, has been slower than it was the decade before. And that's just, it's one of these very slow underground things that you don't notice because it's not like mass unemployment or something, but which is just of enormous importance. Um, because when there's a lot of growth, everybody can have something. Um, when there's not so much growth, I get, can only get stuff because he doesn't get it. And so it has this effect of sharpening all conflict in a way that is much ameliorated when there's high rates of economic growth. 
And I think that's just been tremendously important, which is not to deny the other things um, we said to. I just wanted to, one thing you said that's not quite true um, is that, uh, the, you know, it, when we did this, um, mostly we did it with people without a college degree, um, people with some high school, and people with just a high school degree, and people less than that. And the graphs got awfully cluttered. And so, it, there is a return in terms of health to some college. It's just a after the high school. Yes, diploma? there is. It's just not very large, um, and so the line for the people with some college is much closer to the people who just graduated from high school than it's true to the people. And that's consistent with what John Penn Cavill said that there's some sheepskin effect. For those of you who are not economists, the sheepskin effect is, you know, you go to college. And it's not worth anything unless you actually get a sheepskin at the end. So if you drop out, even if you've done all the classes, unless you have your degree, it's not worth anything. I suspect that may be stronger in this work than it is in labor economics, if only because this certificate is the sort of, this is the way you get into the elite in some sense. You get into the people who are doing well, and it has this big separation. One of the big surprises of us doing this work and writing this book was just the incredible split for condition after condition, for marriage, for pain, for socializing, for wages, that came from just this simple dis dis um, difference between having a college degree and having not had a college, having a four-year college degree, and not having a college degree at all. And you know that that's just to us been a really astonishing thing. Um, and. Who knows what it was? I, I can't resist just saying something about causality. <laughs> um, we, I, you know, again, I'm, I'm actually quite hostile to the way that most economists are thinking about causality these days. Um, and so I'm much more attached to the way that philosophers and um, historians think about uh, historical uh, causality. That there's mostly there's just a lot of interacting forces which are contingent and affect each other jointly, and trying to parse that out in some simple way that nails causality. On the other hand, it's clearly right that correlation is not causality, and our method is basically a sort of Popperian method, which says, you know, if this is true, then we should observe that. We observe it in the U.S., so that's not any task because that's how we constructed it. But does it happen in Europe? Does it happen in other countries in which these things are happening? And that's the way we've tried to parse the thing through the book. And I guess we haven't been super successful. All right. Do I get to say something? Sure. Uh, uh, but I'm kind of I'm, I'm re I, your, your most recent remark reminds me of uh, two English ladies were uh, riding a bus in London, and they were overheard with the following conversation, that one of them had experienced some very sad things in her life, or some things weren't going right, and uh, the other one was trying to cheer her up. And she said, said, dear, dear, don't think about it. Be philosophical. <laughs> that, that might be a good motto for future Tanner lectures, but I suspect <laughs> Why not be good? So, can we move to a sort of broader question? Oh, no, I, I want to clarify one thing that I said about Sir Angus when I emphasized his commitment to and his skill at empirical work. He knows a lot of math. He could actually probably have won the Nobel on the math alone without any empirical. So, he deserves even more credit for what he did decide to do. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Can I go? Okay. Um, I have a question on some of the health facts you were saying on the health section. One point you were saying that opioids are not that useful um, and that they can be replaced. And I wondered if you could elaborate more, more on the data of that. Because from my knowledge, like when you have like people coming in with issues like advanced rheumatoid arthritis, it's cruelty to not give them op opioids and to have them just deal with that pain. 
Well, that, that's the debate that's going on. But, you know, advanced rheumatoid arthritis was there long before opioids came along, and pain has gone up, not down. This is a very sharp debate that's going on, and many people make the position you've made. Um, some of them, when you see it, I mean, Purdue is now imitating the tobacco companies by trying to spread this throughout Latin America and through Asia and so on. And that argument is being used all the time, sometimes genuinely and sometimes not. And it's just impossible to tell. But there are people on both sides of that issue. But then follow up is when you say that there's more pain now than there used to be is how do you measure that? Because like if you've gone to the doctors and they ask you to rate your pain, like it feels very arbitrary at times when you choose between a four and a three. And there are also changes in culture and how people report pain. And how like, for, for instance, there's been uh, articles about how in the past people were less likely to report pain or less likely to emphasize it, while nowadays people are more likely. And then you have even more uh, effect from people who are coming in to hospitals and overrating their pain in order to get opioids. There's no such thing as overrating pain. Pain is what people say it is. There's no other measure. And it's true what you say, that people may report pain that they didn't report before, but there's no such thing as an objective pain. So it's just a mess. Yeah. If you look at the National Health Interview Surveys, which starting back in 1997, every year, asked about various kinds of pain, it's the people who report the pain who, much later in the survey, also report they have difficulty, you know, going out, socializing with friends, whose mental health is poorer. So it certainly correlates very strongly with these outcomes that we care a lot about. And that in both of those circumstances, those dysfunctions have increased. And you even get it for things like sciatic pain, yeah. which people don't make up, for instance, or maybe they do, but it's precise enough that, and you see it across all sorts of different kinds of pain. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I would, just for perspective, I chair the committee for the National Academy that led to the report on relieving pain in America. And so the first part of that is, there is a lot of pain in America. There is actually your number of how much oxy, how much um, uh, um, uh, oxycontin was being administered is also the amount of chronic pain. It's 100 million people a year. But I do think, and I agree with the comments that, that's been made, to say that um, opioids are not helpful in pain is a misstatement. It actually is very helpful in the right setting. What happened, unfortunately, and you, you related this very well, is this became an abuse um, by the Sackler family. It was really a perverse incentive that was financially driven and that led many physicians to be miseducated um, and they began over-prescribing um, this. So it's really a social phenomenon that has a lot of ethical connotations in it, but it shouldn't speak against A, the fact that there is a lot of chronic pain in America, and B, in some settings, opioids play an important role. I agree with almost all of that. And if I said that they don't work, I, I withdraw that. No, no, so. I don't think you said, I think, you know, exactly. But I think there is a place for them, um, but it needs to be highly regulated. And it shouldn't be, whereas I'm also an oncologist, and I can tell you that uh, in my case, for children with cancer, opioids play an important difference as they're fighting serious pain. Yeah, there, I don't think there's anyone in the world who would That's argue right, who would disagree. that you would not give opioids right. for terminal pain. Right. Um, but there, there is certainly disagreement over whether the extension to chronic pain. No, no question. Was and I think it's the not. amount of opioids that was given in it in an unregulated way that was the problem. Uh, hi. Uh, so much of the debate in American health over the last decade or so is focused on insurance. So we've got Obamacare and things like that. I'm just wondering, uh, I didn't hear that term today. I don't know if it was addressed yesterday. Are we focusing on the wrong sort of thing, thinking about nationalized uh, insurance sorts of programs? Uh, should we be focusing on other kinds of things? How does insurance fit into the overall sort of uh, set we've got? Sure. Two. Your question actually involves two questions. One has to do with health policy and what should we doing, be doing about health. And there the answer would seem to be that we are 
obsessed and preoccupied with medical care as the route to better health when there are other determinants, social determinants, uh, housing, nutrition, poverty, and so on, which are very important. And part of your question is, should we be paying a lot of attention to those other determinants of health? Yes. Coming back to medical care itself, uh, are we making a mistake in putting a lot of emphasis on insurance? And the answer there I would give is no, because it's insurance that drives the system. For most medical care bills, 90% uh, is paid for by somebody else other than the person seeking and getting the benefit. And uh, what I have come to realize uh, only recently, really, in a way, uh, is that the way we organize uh, the system now with a heavy reliance on employment-based insurance is absolutely the wrong way to go. What it does is it results in a system which creates a product mix catering to the high-income people. And the people at low and middle level income would probably be, or some of them anyway, would be much better served by a different product mix that put more emphasis on lower prices and a diff different set of amenities, uh, uh, access, uh, extra capacity, and so forth. So I think the emphasis on insurance is very important. In, if you're going to get any fundamental reform in the healthcare system, it's going to be through a change in the way it's financed. Right, I agree with that. I mean, one of the things, yeah, I mean, no one should take away the idea that just getting rid of insurance would make it all okay because the health system's performing so badly. That's not true at all. And it's especially not true, however badly it's performed in the opioid crisis. We're now in a situation where a lot of people are not getting treated for opioid addiction because they don't have access to um, insurance which would provide them with medically assisted treatment to get over their addiction. My, my next piece, tentatively titled, but the editors will change it anyway, is can single payer be a catalyst to fundamental reform of health care? Hello, thank you very much for that informative talk. Um, and my question was uh, really around alternative economic systems. So you gave us a really good overview of you know what works in capitalism and what doesn't work, uh, and some of the inherent characteristics, specifically around profit seeking, that lead to some of the uh, challenges over time. Um, my question was, are there ideas or concepts from alternative economic systems that may be applicable in the current time, especially comparing Europe and, say, America, uh, that may be relevant? It's a great question. Um, and I, again, I had too much on my slides and I went too fast because I would have talked some of that. I'm a huge defender of capitalism. And I think, you know, it, it's over the last 250 years, it's taken us from incredible poverty to the incredible affluence that we have today. Um, China and India would not have grown as they've grown without, um, you know, the profit motive and without people trying to get rich. And so the question is not, let's do away with capitalism. I mean, the only alternative we know is socialism, and that was just a disaster. So that, that's the last thing we want. Um, we also have to be very careful about the right role of government, because government plays this role in rent-seeking. You know, so I, it's very easy for someone like me to get carried away by the libertarian view and say we don't need any government at all, but that's not going to work. And it's certainly not going to work um, for health care. So the secret here is that I think we've gotten into a position where capitalism in America and potentially in other European countries is not delivering for a large chunk of the population, the chunk of the population we've been talking about here. And this has happened before. I mean, one of the things we talk about in the book is in 1800, you know, after the Industrial Revolution had begun to start, 
um, you had a period of regress. There was no increase in real wages for 50 years. Um, you basically until all the handloom workers had gone. Um, and you know, economists were sitting around saying, what are the wage question, the labor question, you know, how are we ever going to get real wages out? And my friend, the historian Bob Allen, likes to say, wages started rising on the day that Karl Marx published Das Kapital. <laughs> <laughs> he got it just 100% wrong. Right? Um, after the Second World War, there was a widespread belief that capitalism had failed again, you know, the, the Great Depression, that we'd been saved by the war, and that something had to happen. And what happened, in some ways, that rescued was the beverage report and its implementation in Britain by Clement Attlee's government over a period of three to five years, in which they started a national health service, they had um, pensions, you know, they, they, they had education for everybody, and there was this sort of huge construction of the modern safety net, which took the sting out of capitalism, but at the same time, you could let things rip. So I think we're in a position my judgment is we're in a position now where we need another course correction like that, which will preserve everything. The last thing we want to do is get rid of it. So we've got two more. One on the side and one on that, and then we'll be done. Okay. Here. Yeah, you actually kind of answered my question. Uh, for the first hour, I had the impression that you painted a very bleak picture of the way things are currently. And the reason why I was puzzled is that everything I've learned so far says just the opposite, that these are the best of times. This is the golden era of humanity. Right. You know, the, the 20th century and the very beginning of the 21st century, uh, including medical and healthcare. You know, I mean, look at longevity for one reason. It's going down. It's been going so, down I mean, in the last three years. So, right. So, the, these, on a positive note, these are the best of times, yep. not the worst of times. That's, you know, my last book was all about that. Um, so, I wrote a book called The Great Escape, which said all of that, that this is the best of all Wait, wait, wait a few decades, and you'll decide that the best of times was when you were younger. <laughs> I just want to pick up on a, two questions back, and what we need in a healthcare system is one that is fundamentally organized, organized and incentivized to keep people healthy. Most of the money now goes to people with chronic conditions, and episodic fee-for-service medicine is just not uh, appropriate for that. We need something much more like prepaid group practice. <laughs> where the incentives and the organization are to manage people's chronic conditions and uh, you know, to keep, make them healthy or keep them healthy. It just, it's a fundamentally different kind of healthcare system from uh, what we've had. Thank you. Maybe I just say one thing about, uh, just to conclude really this question, you know, there's been huge progress over the last 250 years, and we are better off than we've ever been in history, so I agree with that. But that was never smooth. You know, there were huge periods of regress. Think of the 1930s. Think of what happened during the so-called Great Leap Forward in China. Think of what happened under Stalin. You know, there, things went wrong, and, you know, we always got back on track again. But there's no guarantee that's always going to happen again. And I think why we need a correction now is if we don't fix things now and get it back on the good side, we're really in danger of losing it. And that's what I want to avoid. Okay, I want to close this out first um, by thanking you all for coming, um, thanking our speaker, our two Tanner lectures, and our um, today, tonight's commentator. There is a seminar tomorrow at 10, in which Anna Lemke and Dan Wickler will be giving further comments on the lectures. Um, so I invite everybody to come, and the other commentators will be there as well for a discussion, 10 o'clock in the building Littlefield, the Wattis Room in Littlefield, and that will be from 10 to 12. And now just join me in thanking um, the lectures.